Oh, it's you again. Curious, are you? You know, thousands of years ago, during the golden era of scientific inquiry in the 3rd century BCE, as Greek civilization began reaching new heights, a lot of people started asking some reasonable questions, like the true nature of things and what's the world we live in like. The more galaxy-brained among us focus on the mechanics of the universe, while more down-to-earth people focus on the inner workings of our own bodies. Herophilus was one such fella. He was pretty curious about the nature and workings of our human bodies. But at the time, endeavors like dissecting dead human bodies in ancient Greece and ancient Egypt weren't exactly looked upon with favor. But in a little place called Alexandria, under the reigns of Pilotomy I, Soter, and Pilotomy II, Philadelphus, such dissection was eventually allowed for academic purposes. Unsurprisingly, the philosophes and medical practitioners of the time decided it would be a great idea to make Alexandria their home. After Hilophilos got his education at the Hippocratic Medical School in Greece, nothing to do with hypocrisy, by the way, he came to the city of Alexandria to explore his curiosity and practice his profession. He even got a young disciple by the name of Erasistratus, who worked closely with him. Later on, Cornelius Celsius and Tertullian reported that Herophilos and Erastratus went on performing live human dissections, aka vivisections, on criminals provided by Alexandria rulers. Some say they decided to make a show of this gruesome spectacle and put it in full display of the public. Passers-by who realized they have a taste for the more morbid side of life decided to stick around and watch. Obviously, this being the era it was done in, there was no such thing as anesthesia, so these criminals, regardless of what their crime was, were in a world of hurt that you and I probably couldn't even begin to imagine. If they were lucky, they passed out from the pain. And of course, some even died, because, well, vivisection, not exactly safe for life. And if you thought it was simply cut here, cut there, oh no, Herophilos dissected intestines, reproductive organs, eyeballs, etc. And like every controversial step forward in the realm of science, there were detractors and supporters. Some argued that the agony of the few was justified by the widespread benefits of the knowledge that the many would gain. But Tertullian and many others felt that the knowledge gained was not worth the cruelty inflicted. Of course, today, most discussions about the contribution of Herophilos to the field of medicine and anatomy often include debates about whether the atrocities he committed was worth the knowledge he gained. It's kind of a tale of two cats. On one hand, he definitely contributed to the progress of medicine, but on the other hand, the way he did it, you know, by opening the bodies of people while they were still alive, is questionable at best. Yo, you enjoying this video so far? Well, you must be if you're this far into it. Well, there's going to be many more where they came from, and you want to know the best way to find out what they are? Hitting that like button, subscribing, and sharing this video. Alright, I'm done. Back to the content. So, in 1954, the U.S. conducted a nuclear test named Castle Bravo in the Marshall Islands. Said test produced a 2.5 times uh -huh. stronger effect than expected, causing radioactive fallout to spread all over the islands. At first, the effects were unclear. But as time went on, a lot of the islanders had symptoms of things like hair loss, skin damage with serious wounds, etc. Initially, the scientists handling the project realized early on and admitted that there would be quite an impact from the project, but that didn't exactly pump the brakes on the tests. Soon, Project 4.1 was introduced to study the effects of radiation on the exposed islanders. You know, as if they didn't already have enough to deal with. The fact of the matter is, it was a bunch of mad scientists who wanted to see just how bad things were about to get. And the results didn't disappoint. In just the first couple of years, the number of miscarriages and stillbirths among women who were exposed to the radiation doubled, then apparently seemed to go back to normal. However, a lot of children exposed began to show developmental problems and slower growth. However, there wasn't a clear pattern. Of course, many of us nowadays would think that these tests need to stop immediately, Ah, but hindsight is 2020. Nope, these mad scientists had other things in store for these poor people. In the following years, the effects became pretty much undeniable. Kids exposed to the radiation began to develop thyroid cancer at a much higher rate. Reason being that radioactive iodine was released during the test, which the thyroid gland tends to absorb. And by 1974, almost a third of exposees were developing various types of cancers. Eventually, a representative of these people later cried out against the U.S. government, as they very well should have, proclaiming that the experiments were all planned. 
but the government didn't have much to say. Well, I got something to say. Kind of a dick move, Uncle Sam. Now let's head across the water and find out about the Camara. No, I didn't just pronounce Camaro wrong. Hear me out. The Camara was a Soviet Secret Service's poison laboratory known as Laboratory 1 and Laboratory 12. In case the mention of the word poison didn't give it away, these were basically research and development facilities for the use of poison in the Soviet Secret Services. Their goal? Find an odorless, tasteless chemical that could not be detected. One that would have, well, life-ending effects on human beings. And what were the test subjects? Well, I can tell you it wasn't rats. Nope, it was the Gulag prisoner population. And, this being the Soviet Union, I'm sure they were all deserving of their fates. In case you didn't catch on, that was sarcasm. Among their little party favors was Curie, which is a strong muscle relaxant that chokes you to death, Cyanide, which causes violent seizures and heart attacks, and Ricin, which causes extreme internal misery and agony. Oftentimes, these poisons were given to their victims with a meal or drink, or disguised as medication. Of course, these alone are bad enough, but eventually they came to create a toxin known as C2. According to witness testimonies, the victim changed physically, became shorter, weakened quickly, became calm and silent, and then died within 15 minutes. Grigory Myronovsky, lead biochemist of the project, subjected various people of different ages, physical conditions, and so on, so that they could have a more complete picture of the effects of the poison. Of course, it wasn't just all for experimentation, as Marinovsky also personally executed people with these poisons, often under the supervision of Pavel Sudoplatov. Call me paranoid, but if I ever find a medicine that I need to take that says made in Russia, I'll have second thoughts. You know, back in the day, syphilis was an awful illness to get. Really bad news if you got infected with that. So naturally, the scientific community needed to figure out how to cure it. At least I hope that was the mentality behind the United States Health Service between 1932 and 1972 when they conducted a study on 399 poor, mostly illiterate, African-American sharecroppers in Tuskegee, Alabama. What did the study entail? Why they deliberately infected these poor people with syphilis and didn't treat them. The infections were accomplished by either having infected sex workers give these poor fellows a good time or through open wounds with a lucky few even getting infected through perforation of the spine. Ouch. As you can imagine, this study became notorious because it was conducted without due care to its subjects, which eventually led to reforms in how patients are protected in clinical studies. Thank God. But for those poor souls in the Tuskegee syphilis study, the consent that they gave was ill-informed, and they were not even informed of their diagnosis. Instead, they were told they had bad blood and could receive free medical treatment, rides to the clinic, meals, and burial insurance in case, you know, they passed from participating in the test, which many of them did. In 1932, when the study began, the standard treatments for syphilis were toxic, dangerous, and often of questionable effectiveness. And part of the goal of the study was to determine if patients were better off not being treated with these toxic remedies. As a result, treatment was intentionally denied, and many were lied to and given placebo treatments in order to observe the fatal progression of the disease. But years later, between 1946 and 1948, the United States would outdo themselves, if you can believe it, with another experiment. Over 5,500 natives of Guatemala, including children and patients of mental hospitals, were involuntarily added to the experiment. The profile of one subject by the name of Berta gives a detailed description of just how fun this experiment was. Fun being short for flipping unbelievably nefarious. Berta was a female patient of a psychiatric hospital who was injected with syphilis in February of 1948. A month later, she got scabies, a skin infection caused by an invasion of tiny mites. Weeks later, Dr. John C. Cutler, the guy in charge of the study, Notice that she also developed red bumps where he had injected her arm, lesions on her arms and legs, and her skin was beginning to waste away from her body. Poor Berta did not actually get any treatment for her syphilis until three months after her injection. Later, on August 23rd, Cutler wrote that Berta appeared as if she was going to die, but did not specify why. That same day, he put gonorrheal pus from another male subject into both of her eyes, 
as well as in her urethra and rectum. And then as if he needed further proof of being the world's biggest douchebag, he reinfected her with syphilis. Days later, Berta's eyes were filled with pus from the gonorrhea, and she was bleeding from her urethra. Three days later, on August 27th, Berta passed, which is quite possibly the most merciful thing that could have happened. By the end of the study, only 74 test subjects were still alive. 28 of the men had died directly of syphilis, 100 from related complications, 40 of their wives had been infected, and 19 of their children had been born with congenital syphilis. Yeah, sometimes, depending on who's in charge, searching for a cure is not all sunshine, lab results, and test tubes. You know, nowadays, many people associate Japan with video games, anime, toxic work cultures, etc. But there was a time in history when Japan was, let's be nice and say, misguided. In the days of the Second Sino-Japanese War and World War II, there was a place called Unit 731, a unit of the Japanese Imperial Army that undertook lethal human experimentation. You already know where this is going. It was a covert research facility where the focus was biological and chemical warfare, and the site of some of the most notorious war crimes carried out by the Japanese Imperial Army. Just a few of the numerous atrocities committed here under the command of Shiro Ishii and others include lovely things like live vivisections, including pregnant women who were impregnated by doctors, prisoners having their limbs amputated and reattached to other parts of their body, what do these people think they're making Frankenstein? People having parts of their bodies frozen and then thawed to study the results of untreated gangrene. What else was happening in there? Let me take a look at my notes here. Oh, people were also used as live test subjects for grenades and flamethrowers. Others were injected with various diseases disguised as vaccines to study their effects. And then as if just to solidify the absolute <laughs> evil that went on in this place, male and female prisoners were deliberately infected with syphilis and gonorrhea via re uh, forced intercourse to study the effects of these diseases if they went untreated. As the war was coming to an end and the Soviet Union drew near, Japanese authorities swiftly destroyed Unit 731 in order to remove any trace of the evil that surrounded this place, and all surviving detainees were put to death. But true evil can never hide for long, as the United States found traces of proof, and then threatened to turn over Japanese officials to Soviet authorities if they failed to disclose the information they gleaned. Because Uncle Sam, as luck would have it, was very interested in the, uh, data gathered from these experiments, despite the obvious and inhumane horrors. So, in exchange for the data, the U.S. government granted immunity to quite a few of the people involved, including Ishii. Not everyone escaped. Some of the monsters of Unit 731 became targets for prosecution by Soviet leaders. Unfortunately, only 12 of these people were found guilty. Their punishment? Several years in labor camps. I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem anywhere close to enough. Ultimately, these experiments serve as a reminder for humans' potential for depravity as well as discovery. But hey, as long as we acknowledge the depravities of the past, the discoveries of the future can be made all the more sweet and humane. Hey, you made it to the end! Good for you! Also, thanks for watching. If you found this video insightful, be sure to like and subscribe for more thought-provoking content. Don't worry, I promise not all of it is creepy.